Hey guys, what's up? My name is Sky Webb and I'm here to talk about a true crime story that I cannot get off my mind. But before I get started, I just want to put out a little disclaimer that I mean no harm to any of the victims or the victims' families and I wish everyone who was hurt within this story the utmost peace and solace either in rest or in recovery. With that out of the way, happy True Crime Thursday. Welcome back to my channel or just welcome if you've never been here before. If you have never been here before, please go and hit subscribe because I would really appreciate it and I post true crime videos every single Thursday and I don't want you to miss out on that. Uh, I just want to get it out of the way. I look like shit. I feel like shit. I don't give a shit. I'm very sorry for this appearance. I also just want to say thank you because this case was recommended to me and it's a very full-on case it's literally straight out of like a horror movie like it is insane anyway thank you so much for this recommendation and if anyone else has any recommendations please drop them down below because I always take them into consideration and it's just very helpful and I'm very grateful before we get started I just need to put out a little content warning that this uh, story can be very graphic it's uh, very intense and it involves torture and sexual abuse so if that's not for you go click a different video Okay, enough of that, we can get into it now. Today's case is about Junko Ferrata. Junko Ferrata was born on the 22nd of November 1971 in Japan, and she was only 17 years old at the time of her kidnapping. Junko was a very well-behaved girl. She was very good at school. She was very well-disciplined. She got really good grades. She had a part-time job. She was just a very hardworking girl and she was striving towards a good future and, you know, trying to achieve all of her goals. On the 25th of November 1988, Junko finished her shift at her part-time job and so she usually just rode her bike to go home and that's exactly what she did on this day. She got on her bike and she began the ride home, but as she was going past some, like, hedgy bushes, a guy just jumped out of the bushes and pushed her off her bike and then ran off and she was like, what the fuck just I like completely startled like what just happened there was another boy from across the street and he witnessed what happened and as soon as you know she kind of fell and the other guy ran off this boy ran over to help and offered to walk her home uh so that she wasn't by herself so this boy who was offering to walk her home she actually knew him he was from school they they went to high school together so he was a very familiar face and obviously comforting uh in this situation where you've just been attacked and this boy had actually asked Junko out in the past and she said no, you know, respectfully declined uh, because that wasn't part of her, you know, goals. That wasn't on her priority list. Like she didn't want to date. She just wanted to succeed throughout high school, you know what I mean? But this guy was super, super popular. Everybody liked him. A lot of people just you know sort of did what he said he was like that leader kind of guy he wasn't really used to being told no or rejected necessarily uh but as he was walking home he was nice as pie and they got on really well and his name was hiroshi miyano so as they're walking hiroshi sort of takes the lead and he's sort of choosing the direction in which they walk and she's kind of distracted she's just talking to him and like not really thinking about what she's doing and he leads them to an abandoned warehouse. Now, as soon as they get to this warehouse, Hiroshi completely turns on her. His attitude completely shifts. He's now yelling, he's now aggressive. He was demanding she do whatever he said. He uh, threatened her with this big Japanese organized crime group, this like gang type of thing. Uh, which he claimed he had connections to and a lot of people throughout the high school knew that he had connections to them So it was something he often boasted about and so she obviously believed him and He threatened to have her killed if she didn't just do whatever he said So at this point, I'm sure you can imagine Junko was just absolutely freaking out She had just been assaulted on her bike This guy that she knows has just completely flipped completely turned she's been threatened to be killed she doesn't know what's going to happen she doesn't know what he's capable of and so she just walks inside the warehouse like he tells her to and this is where he rapes her he then takes her to a hotel and proceeds to rape her another two times and then when he's finished he refuses to let her leave so at this point hiroshi calls up his best mates and they all collectively decide that it's a great idea 
to keep Junko uh, so that they can all rape her. Uh, and so they decide to meet at a park. So he takes her to this park and they meet up with the friends and their names were Joe, Sinji and Yasushi. And Junko recognizes Sinji as the boy who had actually kicked her off her bike. So as it turns out, that was a complete setup uh, designed to get her to feel, you know, vulnerable and like she needs help and to get her to this warehouse. We would later learn that this is something these boys did often. They didn't necessarily succeed very often, but they had in the past uh, kidnapped and gang raped other females and then, you know, let them go. But this is something they did quite often was trying to find them. It just it didn't always work. So the boys went through all of Junko's belongings and they were able to find her home address on a diary of hers and so now they were threatening that if she did anything wrong if she acted up if she tried to escape if she tried to call for help they would just kill her whole family they would have this these gang members that they were affiliated with go to their house and just kill everybody so she was terrified at this point they took her back to Hiroshi's house but he actually lived with his parents so they convinced her to pretend like she was one of the boys' girlfriends just in case the parents asked because uh, I guess they didn't want to come home and be like, hey, we kidnapped a girl. So they had this little cover story, but as it turns out, the parents didn't really fucking care that much, did they? They say now that they were just too afraid to question their own son, too, too scared of Hiroshi and uh, what he was capable of, so they just didn't want to interfere. Um, but yeah. So after about a day, Junko's family called the police and a big search party went out. Uh, they were putting up missing persons posters and all kinds of things around the street, which was getting quite a lot of attention. So like, let's be honest, Hiroshi's parents knew what was going on. They're from the same town. They went to the same school. Like they knew that this girl was missing. They knew. But the boys were terrified about this search that was going on because they thought it was going to obviously come back to them. They didn't want to get caught. They didn't want to go to jail. They were freaking out. So they forced poor Junko to call her own parents and say, I'm fine. I run away with a friend. I'm happy. I'm safe. Uh, please stop looking for me. And the parents were like very hesitant to believe this, obviously and they forced her to beg her parents to stop looking for her which i like how disheartening would that be that you know no one's coming to get you because you begged them not to you know like it's horrible so from this point on the boys knew that they could do whatever they wanted to junko uh without repercussion or so they thought they thought that no one was coming for them, no one was looking for her, and, and they were fine. So this is when the torture began, and it lasted for 40 days. So out of those four boys, it was estimated that they had raped her over 400 times. 400 times. 400! Just between those four boys. And it didn't stop there because they enjoyed bringing over their friends to show off Jungo like she was like some hot commodity, like, they like to bring people over to partake in the rape and torture and so it's estimated that she was actually raped by another hundred men or a hundred boys that had just come and gone she was beaten daily she would be hung from the ceiling and they like, punched and kicked like she was a boxing bag like they would literally use her like a punching bag they would drop heavy weights on her they'd stomp on her head against the concrete they'd literally hold her head there while someone else stomped on it they would make her dance and sing before after and during being tortured and being sexually assaulted and they used to pour hot wax on her eyelids just for fun they'd force her to eat bugs her own shit and urine like just sick weird dumb shit for no fucking reason and the sexual assault started to get more violent as time went on they would use uh cigarettes and lighters to burn her genitals to the point where her whole like lady bits was just 
like mangled, like literally mangled from just how badly they burnt it and thrashed it all the time. They pierced her nipples with sewing needles and then they decided, hey, why don't we just rip the whole fucking thing off? And they tore her left nipple off with pliers. They also used to put things into her vagina and her anus, things like lit light bulbs and fireworks, which they set off inside of her. What the fuck? And because of this intense, horrific pain and the injuries and, you know, the trauma to her body that she was constantly going through, she would occasionally slip into unconsciousness at which point they would just dunk her head underwater until she came to and then just like continually dunked her underwater until she was ready to continue being tortured. So like I mentioned, uh, their friends would often come over to join in on the abuse and there was just one friend that was a little bit less than willing or less than excited, you know, about the whole torture thing. He still did it, he still did these horrible things, uh, he still partook in it, but when he went home the guilt got too much for him and so he actually told his brother, his brother told their parents and their parents told the police. So unfortunately he didn't know Junko's name so obviously either did the brother or the parents so they couldn't relay that information onto the police, all they could say was there's a girl, there's a girl being tortured just you know an, anom an, an anonymous girl so two police officers went to Hiroshi's house to uh, follow up on this report about the girl being tortured and his parents opened the door so the police are like so is there a girl inside and the parents are like no 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 there's no girl we don't know what you're talking about they just completely acted dumb completely acted innocent assured them there's absolutely no like torture, there's no girl in the house and they offered for the police to come in and have a look and like check for themselves. So the police actually declined this offer <laughs> uh, because they considered that offer as a sign of innocence. They thought that if they were guilty, they wouldn't have invited them in to have a look around, which is like, how can you be that bad? at your job. So the two police officers uh, walked away and they left Junko at Hiroshi's house. Then if we fast forward a couple of weeks, Junko managed to find a phone uh, while the boys were busy being assholes. And she tries to call the police, but unfortunately Hiroshi catches her before she has a chance to say anything. The police actually call back and he's like, oh, it was a mistake, it was a mistake, you butt dial, like whatever. Uh, so she didn't get anywhere with that, but he decided to punish her for it. So the way that they decided to punish her was covering her legs in lighter fluid and then setting her on fire. And then they inserted a glass bottle into her anus which caused a lot of bleeding. It, it caused a really quite serious injury. Uh, so between a bleeding bum and legs that are literally on fire and burning, uh, the injuries, the pain, it was too much and her body just went into shock and she started having convulsions. And the boys thought, or so they claim they thought that she was faking it. They didn't think that they were real convulsions. Uh, so, <laughs> they decided that they had to punish Junko for faking these convulsions. So they set a convulsing Junko on fire again. Ha so at this point, Junko had injury after injury after fucking injury. She was a mess. They started making her sleep outside on the balcony in freezing cold weather. So she didn't even get that like small amount of peace where she could just go the fuck to sleep. Like she would literally be outside, not able to sleep, shaking. Like it was, it was just brutal. She was so badly injured that she couldn't even walk down the stairs to go to the bathroom. It would take her an hour to like limp, crawl, just anything she could to get down these stairs to get in the bathroom over an hour 
And it just got to the point where she was asking multiple times a day, please just kill me. I know you're going to kill me. Just get it over with. Just kill me. Because the pain was too much. The sickness, the injuries, it was just way too much. And she eventually became incontinent because of all of these injuries. Like she had really bad injuries to her reproductive system. She had bad injury. Oh, it just, it was so brutal. Uh, it got to the point where she couldn't control her bowel movement. She couldn't control her bladder. And so she would wet herself and she would shit all over the place. And then they would punish her for not being able to control those things, even though they're the reason she couldn't fucking control those things. It even got to the point where she couldn't, she couldn't even swallow food. She couldn't eat food. She could barely keep down water. It got to the point where every time she tried to even eat anything, her body would just reject it. Like it, it, her body had just had enough. And it was like, I can't fucking do this shit, bro. By the time they were done with her, she was completely unrecognizable. She'd been burnt, she'd been beaten, she'd been starved, she'd been cut. Her face was so swollen, you wouldn't ever even recognize her. Her private areas had been so badly damaged and mangled. Obviously, she's missing a, a nipple. Like, there was just such severe injuries all over her. There was burns. There was swelling, there was bruising, there was, oh, it was just insane. She also smelt really bad because she didn't have the capabilities to wash herself. She didn't have the capabilities to look after herself. She couldn't even get down the stairs. She couldn't control her bladder. She couldn't control her bowels. She was constantly wetting herself. She was constantly shitting herself it's gonna eventually smell and so because of all of these injuries there was like pus there was all kinds of gross shit like bodily shit that was just going on and the the boys became less attracted to her they weren't as a uh, sexually motivated i guess in in the in the assault uh and so they actually went out looking for another girl and so they actually pulled the same trick as they did with poor junko this 19 year old girl was riding past on her bike one of the boys knocked her off and then the other boy pretended to be like her knight in shining armor and help her and uh walk her home and so they raped this 19 year old girl but then they let her go home they let her go on the 4th of January 1989, Hiroshi challenged Junko to this little game. It's a Chinese game. It's like made up of tiles. I can't pronounce it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and it's it's like half strategy and half luck. And Junko won. She beat Hiroshi. Uh, and he, with his fragile little manhood, decided he had to punish her because he couldn't lose to a girl. So he burnt her eyelids with hot candle wax and then they made her stand up while they like whipped her feet with bamboo cane stick things uh, until she could no longer stand. And then once she was on the ground because she couldn't take it for, like on her feet anymore, they started kicking her again until she had convulsions. And as I said, uh, at this point Junko, uh, she was a mess. like. She just had a lot of bodily fluids going on. She had a lot of injuries. She, she, she was just a mess. Like there's no other way to put it. She was a mess. And so they began beating her and uh, she was bleeding. Her injuries had like started bleeding again. They'd reopened, there was pus. There was all kinds of things going on. And so the boys decided they didn't want to get messy. They didn't want to touch your shit. They didn't want it on their hands. And so they got plastic bags, put them on the hands, like duct taped, duct taped them up and then just began beating her up again. <sighs> this attack went on for over two hours. And this time they again covered her in lighter fluid, this time her entire body, including her face, and they set her alight. Her whole body was on fire and she was trying to put out the fires, uh, but they just, it, it didn't work. And eventually she stopped struggling uh, and the fire went out by itself, at which point she had died. The boys, being such uh, bright individuals, they didn't even realize that Junko was dead at this point. They thought that she was unconscious uh, because that, that tended to happen quite often. And they didn't realize until 24 hours later, at which point they wrapped her up in blankets. 
put her into a travel bag and then shoved the travel bag into an oil drum. They then poured wet concrete into the oil drum before getting rid of it. Three weeks later and the police arrest both Joe and Hiroshi for the rape of the 19 year old girl who they let go and I'm so grateful that A, she was able to get away or they let her go and B, she actually followed up and C, that uh, she got justice for what happened to her and also was able to help solve the case of Junko because, you know, if it wasn't for her, there's a big chance that, you know, none of this would have happened. They wouldn't have been caught. So both the boys were questioned separately and at the same time that this was going on, there had just been a double murder and it was completely unrelated, had nothing to do with these boys as far as I know, as far as anyone else knows, I don't know. Uh, but the police, for whatever reason, thought that there was some kind of connection here. And so when they were questioning Hiroshi, uh, the officers kept sort of insinuating that there was a murder or that they knew about some kind of murder. And so Hiroshi, obviously the only murder he had committed, again, that we know of, was Junko. So that's where his mind went. And then he was like, oh shit, has Joe like told on me? Has Joe tried to throw me under the bus? I want to get on top of this. I don't want to act like I'm the one like not cooperating if he's cooperating. And so he spilt the fucking beans about poor Junko. So they found Junko's body in the oil drum in the spot where Hiroshi led them to. <laughs> Oh my god <laughs> and they weren't able to visually recognize her because she she was just so banged up the poor girl but they were able to identify her by her fingerprints and from here yasushi and sinji as well as hiroshi's older brother they were all arrested as well so all of the boys decided to take a plea bargain so that they'd get a lesser charge so instead of being guilty of a murder charge they pled guilty to causing bodily harm that resulted in a death Sounds a lot like murder to me, bro. Like, what do you mean? In July 1990, Hiroshi was found guilty and sentenced to 17 years in prison, but he thought that this was unfair. He thought that this was too much time, and so he decided to appeal it. He had to go to high court, and <laughs> he was given an extra three years, so he was sentenced to 20 years in prison, and his family was ordered by the court to pay Junko's family compensation. So they actually had to sell their house and pay something like $400,000. So Hiroshi's actually since been released uh, and he changed his last name and is living life as normal. How disgusting. Sinji was only sentenced to four to six years. What? Uh, and he also thought that this was unfair, so he also appealed the decision and he also got extra time. He ended up getting five to seven years. And then in 2018, he got in trouble with the law again. He was arrested for attempted murder after he beat a man with a metal rod and slashed his throat. So yeah, they made a really great decision by only giving him seven years. Like, a really great decision, bro. Joe was given eight years in prison and he's the only one who didn't appeal the uh, decision. Uh, but when he was in prison, all he did was brag about his uh, relation to this murder in this case. All he did was brag and boast about raping these girls and it was disgusting. So there was absolutely no rehabilitation going on there at fucking all. And when he was released, he went and got married. He was living his life up acting like nothing ever happened until he thought his wife was cheating on him and so he tracked down this guy and beat him up for a couple hours and threatened to kill him and went back to prison. Just a little uh, um, background on Joe, J just just because it's important. He is obviously quite fucked up. He went to jail for another seven years for uh, bashing and threatening to kill this other guy, which how is that even on the same level? I don't know, but not the point. His mum is just as delusional and fucked up as he is to the point where she vandalized and destroyed poor Junko's fucking gravesite because she blamed her for ruining her son's life. 
Like, I'm sorry, what the fuck do you mean? He ruined her life and her family's lives and other women's lives. Like, what do you mean? Like, oh, Jesus fucking Christ. That is the Junko Furuta case. Uh, it is a nightmare of a case. It is absolutely terrifying. I, I don't even want to try to imagine being in her shoes. That's absolutely horrifying. Please let me know in the comments down below what you think about this one. What do you think about these boys? What the fuck is wrong with them? They were all underage, by the way. That's why they got such short sentences. They were all 17, 16, 17. What do you think about those police officers who literally like they could have saved Junko's life and they they just didn't because they're fucking idiots uh so what do you think about them also they lost their jobs i don't know if i mentioned that they lost their jobs because of that which i think is good also what do you think about hiroshi's parents do you really think they were too scared to confront him or do you think they just didn't fucking care or do you think that the reason they did offer for the police officer to come in and have a look was to actually catch Hiroshi without them like actively dobbing on him. Do you know what I mean? I don't know. Just a theory. Let me know in the comments down below or you can head over to my social medias which are all linked in the description down below. I would love to hear your opinions and I would also love to hear any recommendations that you may have for me that you want me to cover. I'm always open to new cases. Be sure to give this video a big thumbs up if you feel like it. I would really appreciate it. And be sure to subscribe so that you can see all my new videos. I post every single Thursday all about your crime and I'd love to have you be a part of it. Make sure you guys are being safe out there. Don't trust boys. Don't trust boys. And most importantly, don't trust boys. Thank you guys so much for watching. Stay safe. Bye. Ever been here before please go click subscribe and go watch some of my other videos yeah why are you talking like that i don't know it just happens <laughs> it's like like had like she'd uh and i also just want to say thank you because this case was actually suggested suggested wow